now with uh, our speaker, Christian Braun. She is from the Department of Biology, but she's going to tell you about a very interesting interdisciplinary program that she is involved that brings in researchers from fisheries, biology, statistics, uh, several different programs, and then some of the, the, the research that she does out of that result. Okay, great. Thanks, Erica. I don't know what's going on here. There we go. Okay. Great. So thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for welcoming me today. Um, so yeah, a little different from a lot of the space and stars and planets everybody else in the seminar is talking to you about. Uh, my research is based on, I'm looking at the ranges and movements of bird species in South Africa. All right. And so what my data is, is uh, data collected by citizen scientists. Right? And the idea is they collect a large data set and hopefully answer questions such as uh, how will the species respond to climate change and other changes on our planet. Do I sound okay? Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, yeah, so before I begin, I wanted to, to do a little plug for the program that I'm, that I'm in. It's called Quantitative Ecology and Resource Management, or QUIRM. And there's an undergraduate version called the Quant Center for Quanta Quantitative Science, QSI, and you can do that as a minor if you're, uh, whatever your major is, you can do it as a minor, and you learn different statistical methods uh, that you would apply to ecology and biological research questions. And in the, in the graduate program, it's a lot of adjunct faculty from, uh, like Erica said, statistics, fisheries, forestry, uh, applied math and biology and the idea is that you have a strong foundation in math and then you apply those tools and skills to uh, e ecology. All right so to get started uh, it's always nice to have a little outline so I'm going to first motivate my research why we care uh, then I'll do why I'm here right uh, as I mentioned birds is not stars and planets um, so how I'm related to the space grant. And then after I do that introduction, I'll talk, spend some time talking about the data set that I'm looking at. Um, it's an interesting part of it. And then, you know, my PhD research is all that fourth bullet point analysis. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. And then, um, you know, what the non-scientist is interested in is these ecological research questions that I can answer. So I'll delve into that too. All right. Um, and oh yeah, before, before I begin all of that, I just wanted to present a map of South Africa. Uh, when I first went down there and I told people I was going to South Africa, they're like, oh, what country is that? So it is its own country at the southern end of South Africa, of, I mean, the southern end of Africa. And um, I think it's about twice the size of France, slash twice the size of Texas to give an idea of uh, the size of the country. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking at the bird species that occur in South Africa. All right, so um, right, so a little motivation why we care. Um, you know, a story that you've probably heard before. Right? Our populations are increasing. There's now over seven billion people on the planet Earth. Um, so there's a lot of consequences of having so many people. Right, one is that they need a place to live, so they take up land with just our dwellings where we live. Um, we also need food to eat, so we change the, hab the environment by altering the landscape with crops or pastures. Uh, this is a vineyard. Firefox is available. Uh, right, so we're changing the landscape with our agriculture and also just general with our industry and technologies, we have um, erosion, uh, changes to riverbank, we have pollution and industry. All right, and that leads to that other way we change the landscape is through climate change. All right, so in South Africa, that'll be um, in the eastern part of the country, it'll be wetter and it, where it's already wet, and in the western part of the country, it'll be drier where it's already dry. All right, so that's um, a familiar story, familiar enough story. And um, 
right? And so when we keep doing all of these changes to the planet, it's going to have effect on the other animals that live on this planet, right? And so specifically, I'm looking at the birds there. Uh, this is one of them. It's the southern ground hornbill. And it's, um, it occurs at low densities in South Africa, and it's, it's been listed as vulnerable in the IUCN Red List book. Um, it does well inside protected areas, like national parks, but not so well outside of these national parks. And the question is why? Right? So is it, um, is it because of rainfall changes? Is it because there's cropland, there's more crops? And, um, or is it because of other habitat alterations? Uh, so this is the first species that I'm looking at. So I've spent a couple of years just looking at the modeling of the data set. And now the idea is to, OK, what species to apply it to? And this is the first one I'm looking at. So I'll talk about it again towards the end. But I wanted to mention it now, um, along with a couple other birds that uh, I may apply the model to. So the Hadida and the Mina, those are the two birds up top. They're both increasing their range. Uh, one is the Mina is invasive, and the Hadida is a native. Uh, and then the secretary bird, secretary bird is on the bottom right, and that's um, one of the national birds, and there's not that much known about what drives its ranges and movements. Right. So why we care? Personally, I care because I think they're beautiful creatures, and the more knowledge we have about them, the, you know, the easier, the more we can do to save them and make sure that they continue to exist. Uh, right, so that's... Um, you know, sort of a typical story you'd hear in conservation biology, and it still remains why I'm here. And the reason is, is to answer these theoretical ecology questions, you use a lot of the same tools and skills that you learn when you go off to study physics or engineering or technology. Right? So I wanted to kind of connect that to any under undergrad students who are taking computer science courses or math courses and Sometimes you kind of wonder why, and the examples they give you in class, you may not see, um, they may not really appeal to you. So maybe this is just another application of these, of these skills you can learn now on using them in the future. Right, so yeah, so I'm answering these, these questions using mathematical models. All right, uh, a big part of the work is doing computer work. Right? So it, we're answering theoretical questions, and you answer them on the computer. Right? So I do, um, I do some coding. We, mo we mainly use a program called R, but uh, some quantitative ecologists will also use C++ or Python or Java, really just C++. Um, and so if I knew how to do, like, if I knew that code better, that would be a great skill to have in my field of research. Um, same thing with optimizations, right? So we have these complex equations. How do we find the maximums? And how do we do it efficiently? And all of this involves uh, creating the models and testing the models involves a lot of algorithm work. All right. So I'm not just looking at mathematical models. I'm doing statistical models, right? And so, right, and you can learn statistics without knowing calculus. But if you know cal when you do it that way, you're left wondering, where did these equations come from? Where does, does none of this make sense to me? If you have a really strong background in calculus, it makes a lot more sense. All right. After you get past that basic stat theory and you keep moving on, uh, linear algebra comes into play. So it's, the better you know um, about matrices and their different properties, that's really helpful with more advanced statistics. So I look at a lot of spatial statistics, and that especially, you really want to know about matrices. Um, and then I also, just to mention, I use Bayesian methods. So if you come across that in any of your courses, um, you can think of this as an application for it. So again, the spatial statistics use the Bayesian methods. And then related to the spatial, comp spatial statistics, I use a lot of uh, GIS data, so satellite imagery, 
And uh, it's really helpful to know about how to use ArcGIS as well. All right, cool. So now we're, uh, hopefully you get how my research relates to, um, to other parts of science. And we'll d delve a little bit more into my work. All right, so the data that I'm looking at is the Southern African Bird Atlas Project. All right, and it was, um, it was a project that was done in the late 80s. It was called SABAP-1 in the late 80s. And it went from 87 to 91 about. And then in 2007, they started it again. All right. So what they do, what you do in general in an atlas project is you, you basically put a grid over the country. Right? So in an atlas project, you have a large area of um, a large area like a state or a country. And the idea is to see which species occur over that large area, um, which ones occur, and where they occur. All right. And often it uses citizen scientists, so just volunteers, or it may be research scientists, who go out and collect this data and report what, animal, what animals they've seen and where they've seen it. So they have this, um, this bird atlas project was such a success in South Africa, they now also have a butterfly atlas project and an amphibian atlas project. Um, and there's been lots of other atlas projects around the world too. They're also used often with uh, floral, the floral kingdom too, so um, to do plant species often. So yeah, so for this particular project, what they did in the second version is they broke the country up by the latitude and longitude lines into these sites called pintads, they call them. And it's about five miles by 4.7 miles, five miles height and 4.7 miles width in each site. And they ask volunteers to cover that whole area in about two hours, at least two hours of intensive birding. All right. And then during, while you're birding, you write down all of the bird species that you see in the order you see them, and you submit that list. Okay. Um, so I'll go into that more in a second. I just wanted to go back to this map real quick, uh, just to point out a couple parts of South Africa, so that when I mention them later, you're familiar. So uh, let's see. All right. So there you have uh, Johannesburg, Joburg, a major metropolitan area. A lot of people live there. Um, along the eastern edge here, you have Kruger National Park. Uh, it's really, it's South Africa's most famous national park. It's where you go to see your big mammals, big African mammals. Um, I know there's like, has anybody been to Kruger? Or to South Africa? No? Okay, well, if you go, I, I've, I haven't been to Kruger National Park, but you should go, and I should go there. And uh, that's where you see, like, lions and hippos and, ryan, and rhinos, and uh, I forget all of the big five, but um, a lot of biodiversity li exists there. In this eastern part of the country is the savanna and grasslands. Um, and then you have this coastal area, the... Um, vegetation's a little bit different. And then in this western part, it's desert area. They call it karoo, nama karoo and succulent karoo. So they're small dry shrubs, but um, lower diversity. And then over here you have Cape Town, and you have a vegetation type called finebos. All right, so back to the Atlas project. All right, so, right, so we've broken up the country into all of these sites. And then what, what happens is a volunteer avid bird watcher goes out. Uh, they wake up at dawn, right? That's when the birds are most active. And this is what you do. You have a lot of, a lot of um, area to cover. So you drive around and you look for birds. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, a lot of senior citizens are, are volunteers. 
So, right, so this is me helping to conduct some science. Uh, the South African birds are, you can identify them visually. So, like I said, a lot of driving around and pointing. And then sometimes, let's move that. Oh, well. Um, advertisement for Dropbox. Uh, so, yeah, so sometimes you get out, right? There's a bunch of low trees here. So we got out. There were more bird species there to look around. Uh, right? They give you this little um, magnet to make you official because otherwise you're driving around on a lot of private roads and with binoculars going about five miles an hour. So it looks a little sketchy, but really it's pretty, pretty innocent. So um, the person who's in charge of this project is a scientist at the University of Cape Town. His name is Les Underhill, and he's both an um, avid bird watcher and a statistician. So he's done a great job both in designing the protocol of the project and in knowing how to motivate people to be involved in the project. All right, so since 2007, all right, he's, he's, uh, there's over 1,000 volunteers, and the volunteers are really active. So they've submitted 68,529 lists, checklists. All right, so on average, they've submitted 68 lists. So that's just really a credit to him for getting people out there, getting people involved, getting them active, and keeping them active. Um, I don't know if anybody here is a bird watcher, but a lot of them tend to be a kind of have like a competitive side to them, I guess. So he sets up these little mini challenges that get them to compete with each other to, you know, add to our data set. Uh, I wish that, there we go, okay. All right, so this is what the data looks like um, as we're starting to, to move a little bit more abstractly. All right, so 68,000 lists is great. It's a lot of data, uh, but it also means it's a lot of work organizing it and thinking about it. All right, so here we see that um, where the desert was, there aren't that many surveys. The gray is no surveys. Right, that's, it's hard to get to that area. And once you're there, there's low, low biodiversity. So there's not much incentive for people to go there. Uh, in the urban areas, you have a lot of surveys. So people survey around their homes. Um, in Kruger, you have a lot more surveys too. People are out there looking at wildlife. Um, and then this square is due to one of the challenges that Les set up to encourage people to do a lot of surveys per site. All right, so into my research and the, the models I'm building, that's the kind of data that is really good for my work, and I wish all of the sites were green. Right, so to have multiple visits per site um, is what, what's, what helps my model building. All right, so um, when they did the project in the late 80s, they just, um, they just used this information to say this is about the ranges of each bird species. And that hadn't been done before, so it was great. It was really valuable to get a general idea of the range for each bird. And now, the second time around, the question is, can we get more information out of the data? Right? So can we get correlations with what's going on on the landscape level? All right. And we're starting to get at some of the issues in the data. Right? So there's this highly uneven number of surveys per site. How do we utilize that information as best as we can? Okay. All right, so um, back in the, ba way back in the 90s when they would analyze data like this, they would use regression models to find the correlations. Um, what I have is presence-absence data. So for each of those checklists, each time somebody's gone out into the field, they've said they've seen a hornbill or they haven't seen a hornbill. All right. Um, right, so they've seen it or they didn't see it. So, right, so in the 90s you would say, okay, great, let's use, there were other models that were built too, but most often you'd say, great, let's use a logistic regression. We have binary data 
and find correlations, right? So maybe the hornbill likes to be, you know, it resides in the grass, but maybe it also likes to be somewhat near forests. All right. Um, and then, but with wildlife especially, it's not always so simple. Okay. Um, so there's this third option here, right, where the species was uses the landscape, but it wasn't detected. Okay? Um, and so in about 2002, a paper was put out by somebody named Daryl McKenzie and a couple other scientists, and they said they made kind of a big deal about it. Like a lot of people were analyzing this data with ignore, while ignoring this third part, and they created a model and they said, hey, we can use this model instead to analyze the data. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why the species might go undetected. All right, a simple one is that you might not be able to identify the species. So for the atlas, you really want to be sure you know what the species is before you write it down. Right? So maybe you're not so good at determining swal um, differentiating swallows, so you wouldn't write it down. Uh, another reason it might go undetected is just it went unnoticed. Right, you're covering a really large area in two hours. Um, and a lot of wildlife is camouflaged for a reason, so that you don't see it. Right? So this extends not just to my bird atlas project, but to all, all wildlife data that's collected, like binary. All right. um, and then just a third possibility is that the, bird, the species is out foraging. Right? So maybe it roosts or it nests near here, but it was gone the moment it was being surveyed. All right, so, um, so what we do with, so instead of using just a regression model, now it's got two stages, and we call it an occupancy model. All right, and so um, one of the questions you kind of think about is what does occupancy mean? And it's going to mean something a little different depending on your, your study design and depending on your species that you look at. But for these highly mobile species, I consider it kind of like a habitat usage. Right? So does it, does it use this landscape ever is what you end up looking at. All right, so these uh, occupancy models came out in 2002, 2003. And since then, they've been real hot in the wildlife biology analysis world. And, um, People really like to apply it, but it hasn't, its assumptions and violations of its, sum, its assumptions haven't thoroughly been tested. So how robust the model is, it's not quite known. So part of my research is determining how robust the models are. When, when do they make sense to be used? Okay. Um, another aspect that, of the model that I'm looking at is incorporating spatial autocorrelation. Okay, and what, um, I'll read the real, real definition because there's words up here. So, the degree to which a set of features tend to be clustered together, positive spatial autocorrelation, or be evenly dispersed, negative spatial autocorrelation, over the Earth's surface. Right? And what that means is that, right, so this is, this is the grid that we've laid out. And it was really arbitrarily put over the country, right? It, these lines were drawn without regard to vegetation. It wasn't drawn in regard to city boundaries or to anything else we know about the species that we're looking at. So we can expect two sites that are next to each other to have a positive spatial autocorrelation, right? They're not going to be independent. So normally when you do statistics, you assume everything's independent. And we're definitely violating it in this data set. Right? So if most of these cells are occupied, we might expect this cell to also be occupied. All right? And um, the way that I'm doing it is with a car process random effect. So it's conditional autoregressive, if you're curious. And um, so, yeah, so in, if you're just describing it really globally, it's easy to describe. You just say, well, we want to say that this site is going to be more like its neighbors. 
than you would otherwise expect, than just by chance. All right. Uh, the problem is in the details, so the mathematics behind it is, are difficult. Um, matching the best theoretical way to model it with the way that you can actually model it using the modern computation methods. So to do it with a car process, that's where that Bayesian statistics comes in and um, a lot of the matrix algebra comes in. And so it's great, it can, you can incorporate the spatial autocorrelation into your model, come up with a better model in practice, in theory. Um, in practice, there's a lot of questions surrounding it and it takes a really long time. So I have a really large data set. So it takes, you know, uh, if I'm gonna model the whole country, it takes three weeks. Uh, so working on improving the algorithms behind it. And that's kind of the second area of the research that I'm looking, the second theoretical part of the research that I'm looking at. All right, so, um, so those are kind of the, this and the occupancy model. That's kind of, you know, where a lot of my interest is, but to everybody else outside of the mathematical biology world, they're more interested in these larger research questions, right? And it, obviously that should, be like, you know, there's one thing to build the models for the sake of building models, and it's another thing to actually have, for them to have use, all right? So as I mentioned before, the hornbill is the first species that I've started to look at. Um, it's a really cool, exotic-looking bird. It, uh, it lives in these family groups of three to five members, and they fledge about one individual every nine years. So kind of real stable family groups. They're carnivorous, and uh, these family groups have large territories, 100 kilometers squared. So that's one reason why I'm looking at it is because um, the area that of a territory is so large that if one site is occupied, the neighbor, at least one of its neighbors, has to be occupied as well because the territories are that large. All right, the other reasons why I'm, I picked this species is because it's conspicuous and easily identifiable. All right, so you might miss it because you... Uh, you just, um, the bird was not at the location you were looking at. But if you see it, you're going to be like, that's a southern ground hornbill. You're not going to mistake it for anything else. And it also has a loud call that's very distinctive. All right. Um, the other reason why I picked it is because it occurs at low densities. And its range used to be larger than it is now. So now it's seen mostly in Kruger National Park. It is seen elsewhere in the country, um, but not as often as at Kruger. And they're starting to do reintroductions in different places in South Africa. And so I'm hoping my research can maybe guide those reintroductions on what um, features of the landscape lead to occupancy of the hornbill. All right, and um, so the great thing about, or the great thing, the the bonus about using these occupancy models is that I can say, okay, in a regression model, it said that uh, the hornbill doesn't like to be near crops. But then in the occupancy model, it says, no, it's just harder to detect the hornbill when there's crops there because the crops grow, grow tall enough that you can no longer see it. All right. um, somebody on my committee suggested that they may, their populations may be affected by rainfall. And that was another question that I could answer um, with the occupancy model saying, you know, does the yearly rainfall, is it, is it affect changing where the hornbill is found? All right. Um, so this is what I'm in the process of looking at now. Um, moving forward, there's a couple other species that I have on my radar that I'm interested in looking at. Uh, the African quail finch, it's not vulnerable or threatened, but um, I thought this one was interesting to look at because it's, if you see it, same thing, you can, you'll identify it, that beak, although in this picture it doesn't look that distinctive, it is. Um, so if you're a bird watcher, you'll see it and you're like, there's no question, that's the quail finch. 
Uh, it also has a distinctive call, so if you're a little bit more of an advanced bird watcher, you would know its call as well. Uh, but it hides really well. So what we know about it is a lot of what we know about the quail finch is driven by the detections of it rather than its actual habitat usage. Um, so again, just teasing out that difference between what causes us to see it and what causes it to actually use the habitat. Um, and then moving forward, the next, the next step is to add a temporal component to the model. All right, so um, the mina, it's an invasive in South Africa. It came from India. I know it's in Hawaii, and it's more of a problem there. Uh, it was introduced to South Africa, I think, about 100 years ago, and its population was stable in Durban, and then it started to expand, I think, in the 50s and then it was stable again. Um, and then over the past decade, there's anecdotal evidence that it's expanding again. All right, so when you have invasive, when you have invasive species, um, it is a, it's a big research question to know when do they spread quickly and when do they not, when do, does their range stay more contained. All right, so hopefully through the modeling we can answer uh, what causes its range to expand or what's correlated with this range expansions. All right. Um, and then here, this is a little different, um, but I just wanted to show another example of uh, questions we can answer with this, um, with this data set. So this was research that I actually did a couple years ago. Um, and it's use, still, still using this bird atlas project uh, to answer questions about the ranges and movements of birds. Right? And so we're looking at the barn swallow. And there's anecdotal evidence in Europe that it's expanded, um, sorry, that it's arriving earlier in Europe. And, but what they do is to, to say that it's arriving earlier in Britain, they have one person who looks for the swallow every year. Or they say, whatever the first encounter with the barn swallow is, it's now arrived. Um, and over the past decade, they say it's arriving earlier. Well, there's also the subjective part of that. Of there's more people looking for the swallow, and they expect it to arrive earlier. So how, like, what they see is just following their expectations. Um, and you're, you know, you're, you're, ju you're making this huge statement by seeing one bird, right? Um, it's much better if you have a larger sample. So in South Africa, that's, where, that's the edge of where they go for their breeding, I mean for their um, winter vacation, um, their winter migration. So they, uh, they spend their summers, they spend our summers in Europe, and then they slowly migrate down to South Africa they migrate down to all of southern Africa, and South Africa is the edge of it. So you can see here they're, they're trickling in. They spend a few months in South Africa, and then all of a sudden they get the memo, and they're like, we got to go back to Europe, and they leave pretty abruptly. All right. And so the question is, is um, yeah, did their migrations change from the late 80s until today? And so. Uh, I mentioned briefly that they had done the Atlas project in the late 80s, and then they've repeated it again today, in, from 2007 onwards. Um, and so we compared those two data sets using a nonlinear least squares regression model of the reporting rates, and um, we ended up showing that in a lot of their, their migration patterns have changed significantly between the two time periods, and in some of them, they are indeed leaving earlier. So there is more evidence of them departing South Africa earlier, and therefore potentially arriving in Europe a little earlier as well. So um, just another, another example of what you can do with, these types of, with this type of data and um, these types of analyses. Cool. 
So I'm finishing a little early, I guess, so I so I'm sorry. Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody that's been, people that have been involved, organizations that have been involved along the way. Um, yeah, I got the space grant, an RA ship last winter, along with this Worldwide Universities Network research program grant, and they allowed me to go down to South Africa to collaborate with the scientists there, and it was really helpful. Um, so if people are ever, if anybody is doing any international research, um, I recommend checking this out um, as if a way to fund it. Um, Delta Kappa Gamma is a women's organiz educators organization, and they've provided some support. Um, the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology, they have a great set of computers that allow you to run these models remotely. Um, so instead of spending three weeks on your computer, it's happening on somebody else's. Uh, QSci is the undergraduate version of my department, as I mentioned before. And then also my program, the QUIRM program, Quantitative Ecology and Resource Management. And I want to say if anybody had any questions about uh, a graduate pro an interdisciplinary graduate program, feel free to ask questions afterwards. And thank you.